Awesome. Thank you. Okay, well, I can see everybody's joining. So we will go ahead and get started here. So welcome to another Get Up Stays community special. My name is Stacy Potter. I'm a community manager here at WeFORKS. And today I'm joined by my teammate, Lee Kapili, who is a developer experience engineer who will be walking us uh -huh. through and demoing the Flux Guide on Managing Kubernetes Secrets with Mozilla SOPS. So if you have joined us in the past few weeks or months, you know that uh, we've been doing these talks about every two weeks or so. Thanks so much to Lee for that, um, for the Flux community mainly. And if you are a Flux user, we really appreciate that you're part of that community. And hopefully you know by now that the team has been heads down working on the uh, latest and greatest version, Flux V2. So a lot of these talks have been focused on giving you more, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, sneak peeks on the powerful capabilities we've been able to offer uh, with the new Flux V2. There's still more for us to do and cover on these sessions. So we'll continue to host these. And of course, we welcome your feedback. So please let us know what you think. And if there's any specific issues or guides you'd like to see covered, uh, please let us know. Just a quick note on getting connected uh, with Flux 2. We really wanna encourage you to check out the Flux docs. If you get stuck or you need help, um, please check those docs first. Those are a great resource and the team has really put a lot of effort into making those complete and uh, really flushed out. So um, that's your first step. Uh, we also have been moving a lot of Q&A to the GitHub discussions. If you go to GitHub discussions under the Flux um, uh, GitHub repo there, you can actually go to a category called Q&A and find just a ton of resources there as well. Um, and last but not least, of course, you can always go to the Flux channel and, um, and ping us uh, on that channel as well. So thanks again for being here. A quick note about the company that Lee and I work for. Um, we are called WeaveWorks. Hopefully if you know us, you know us from so much of the work that we've done in and around open source. Uh, of course, today we're featuring Flux, which is in the CNCF as a sandbox project at the moment. Um, but we have submitted our application for incubating status and hoping to get promoted soon, fingers crossed. Thanks again to the Flux team that has been very hard at work on that. Um, Flagger, as many of you know, another open source project from our teammate, Stefan Prodon, uh, that's centered around progressive delivery, such as blue green or canary deployments. Uh, which has also been donated to the CNCF as part of the Flux project. We've got many more projects that are listed here. This is a short list, but to quickly review a few, Cortex is a project that is built on and approve, improves upon Prometheus. Weave Ignite is an open source project that combines Firecracker micro VMs with OCI images, Container D and CNI to unifying containers and VMs. And of course, EKS Cuddle or Control, uh, which is the official CLI for Amazon EKS. We have many other projects. So if you ha have heard about us before, you haven't heard about us before, um, you can read more at our website, weave.works, or you can check out our um, projects on GitHub as well. Quick housekeeping items. Uh, so most of you know Zoom by now, so I won't dig in too much to that, but just to let you know, these sessions usually go around 30 to 45 minutes. We typically have a hard stop at the 60 minute mark. Um, we'd like to use the chat function in Zoom rather than the Q&A. So if you can just find the chat button, it's typically at the bottom of your Zoom window, you can click that and make sure you change the to uh, to all panelists and attendees so that the audience can see your questions as well, unless you have something that's super private. So just a level set, um, we like to give a, a what is GitOps overview just for everyone. If you're brand new, um, we want to cover what is GitOps. So as the name indicates, the Git plus the it's Git plus Ops, or sometimes as we like to say, operations by pull request, where you have a repo as your single source of truth. Uh, it's not just active or just operations, but really a methodology. Uh, that crosses all areas. We talk about GitOpsing all the things and the business value that comes with that are reliability, velocity, and security benefits. 
it's also a paradigm or a methodology. It's not just one single tool or technology. Of course, we are very excited about Flux and we work really hard to get it to a place that we've already brought GetOps value, but we're thinking about the vision of the most powerful way we can think about GetOps in the coming years and hopefully decades. And we really do feel that even if you're not using Kubernetes, you can still do GetOps. But if you are using Kubernetes, um, it's really part of the evolution of Kubernetes, leveraging that Kubernetes API and what that brings and really is the next step and way of leveraging the benefits of that technology. And we're really excited to be a part of, part of that community. So check out our YouTube channel. That's where this video will be posted along with all of the other videos that we've done in this series. It's youtube.com slash C slash Weaveworks Inc. Um, so you can find all of our great stuff there. And then the principles of GitOps. So uh, I'll run through these really quickly. Not everybody has these four principles. So really anywhere you start is a great way to get started on your journey. Uh, whether you're using Git as your versioning system or not, the important thing is that you're using a versioning system. Other core principles are that you have a declarative system and that you have a way in which changes are automatically applied to that system. And then at the end, you will have ways of reconciling and ensuring you have correctness and alerts with that. That is a quick and dirty overview of the four <laughs> principles uh, introduced by, to us by Cornelia Davis at the first GitOps days um, back in May of 2020. And uh, yeah, check out that playlist that we have public on our YouTube channel as well. And with that, it's demo time. So Lee, I will stop sharing and turn it over to you. Yeah, super excited about this one. Um, I like to consider myself a member of the geese community, you know, and so anytime we talk about uh, secrets and security and the benefits that you get from using GitOps to secure the approach that you configure or that you, you work uh, with your teammates to configure your Kubernetes clusters. Um, I think that the security benefits of GitOps are uh, numerous and all in, in like kind of just weaved through the entire approach. And I uh, just had a great talk actually with Lorenzo Fontana at KubeSec uh, just last week. Go ahead and, and uh, look that up. I think they posted the recording already. Uh, but we talked about the benefits of why GitOps makes your platform more secure. And today's demo is about secrets management, uh, which is super um, just intertwined with your security approach. And um, if you have, well, I mean, just consider it's like you've, you're bootstrapping clusters with your infrastructure, right? So if Flux is part of that, then there needs to be a story for how you get secrets into the cluster, uh, how you maintain the life cycle of them. Now, if we go just consider that slide that Stacy was, uh, was talking through about the principles of GitOps, right? You want a system to be declaratively managed. You want to be able to keep track of versions and changes over time, who touched things, who approved things, who collaborated on them. Uh, you want those things to be applied uh, and considered correct all the time. And these, these components of the GitOps principles, when you adopt something like Flux and Kubernetes together, they apply really well to keeping a, an audit log and an understanding of what is in your infrastructure at any one point in time. Consider it would be really unfortunate if somebody compromised one of your production systems and changed your database connection credential to exfiltrate all of your customers' data from then on. But when you're using Flux, the secret is constantly reconciled from a declarative and version source. You have visibility into what you wanted at that particular time you know within reasonable reconciliation guarantees uh, that that secret is applied inside of your production cluster and that your database is being connected to in the proper way. And um, the application workload is also declaratively described in the same repository referencing that secret, right? You don't have this kind of visibility if you're just managing a bunch of Linux servers. 
And um, unless, you know, you were baking immutable images or something with your secrets inside of them, which would have a totally different, you know, set of uh, security issues since you're, you would need to be storing this, the secrets inside of the artifacts. So um, let's talk a little bit more about why uh, Flux is cool in this approach. And uh, today I'm gonna be talking about two systems interacting together in a very nice way. Uh, that is Mozilla SOPS, a great way to do uh, Git and secrets together. Face just lit up because I'm opening the OG Microsoft Paint. And um, so let's, let's just cover the basics of asymmetric encryption really quick. In normal in encryption and decryption flows, you're going to have the ability to encrypt and then decrypt some plain text or a binary value, right? So if I have like some password, you know, then it goes, it gets encrypted through this arrow. Then it ends up over here in like some stamped blob of incomprehensible, you know, whatever. This is not human readable. There's no way to decode this value without using some sort of key, right? So in symmetric encryption, this one key is able to do both of these things. But in asymmetric encryption, using some fancy math based off of prime numbers and the ease of which you can come up with prime numbers, but the difficulty in which you can factor them uh, which is kind of the basis of that, you actually have one key that is for encrypting and then a separate key that can only decrypt that value. And what you end up getting is kind of the primitive for building a messaging system in which you can either... Um, and, and this can actually be flipped around as well. You can use these keys both ways, right? So if you use the decryption key to actually encrypt a value, then the only person that can read it is the person who owns the encryption key. Uh, but if you kind of flip things around, uh, then it gets a little interesting. Anyway, the uh, what we will do today is we are going to use SOPs inside of our git repo. So we'll have a git repo. Inside of that git repo, we will put SOPs encrypted secrets. We will encrypt those things. Uh, say this is like some kind of YAML file, right? We'll encrypt this using a public key. So this is really key are uh, really important here. We're going to use a public GPG key to encrypt a value to put it into our repository. And not only that, but we are going to actually put that public key into the repo as well so that anybody who has access to the repo can make these encrypted documents. Now, the only way that these encrypted documents can ever be unwrapped again is inside of our Kubernetes cluster we're going to have a Flux installation. And the Flux installation is going to be synchronizing to the repo, right? But inside of the resources that Flux manages, it can then use a decryption key that we will just bootstrap into the cluster using a manual task. We'll configure Flux uh, to know how to unwrap these values inside of the Git repository. So the uh, the flux config here will will say, hey, we want to use this kind of thing to unwrap that. And then flux will be able to, since the key is inside the cluster, pull the secret in and only at the time and for the object that actually needs that value we will pull the secret in and then it can be put in to back into its plain text value stored as a Kubernetes secret. 
And the reason why I wanted to draw this diagram out is because this is a lot better than where we normally kind of are with decrypting secrets, because for the same benefits that you get with having access to the cluster, right? Flux is inside the cluster, so the access to the cluster is itself. You, do, you no longer have some kind of external system, say you were to have like CI that was pulling from Git and then putting things into the cluster using some access key, right, through the Kubernetes API. This security surface uh, can be completely eliminated. And in the same way, we no longer have to put decryption keys into CI. We no longer have to give some external service or some external set of servers access to unwrap that value before sending it to Kubernetes. Since Flux is running inside Kubernetes, we can put the decryption key there as well and store it within a namespace that no other applications have access to. So this is the, the value of what we're going to be doing today. And because we are going to be using asymmetric encryption, our repository can actually be public if we want. Because these secrets, even though we're storing them inside of Git, we're protecting them with encryption that only the cluster is able to decrypt, right? So that's what our little GPG guide is here. Now, it's important to know that SOPS has other backends as well. You could use Azure Key Vault or AWS or Google Cloud KMS. Um, but in this case, uh, I'm just demonstrating a generic way, generic approach that's cloud agnostic. Uh, you can generate some GPG keys, you could have a key server, you could back them up in, you know, your password manager, uh, like one pass or, you know, last pass or Bitwarden, and then, um, yeah, be, be on with your life and not have to worry about your cloud integration uh, to make your encryption decryption for secrets management work. GPG uh, is installed on most Linux machines, and it's good enough uh, for this task when you combine it with SOPS and Flux. So uh, we already have all these tools installed. Um, I'm also just gonna do a little bit of bootstrapping here. So I have a kind cluster. And then um, just made one of those. Here's my GitHub user and my personal access token that I use for Flux Bootstrap demos. Uh, this just has repo create access. And then I will run Flux Bootstrap using the Flux command line tool, the GitHub provider. Um, and I am going to create a new repository or ensure that one exists. Currently, there isn't one at the moment. Uh, this will be a personal repo. And then by default, these are private repos because Flux is able to bootstrap some PKI for you using uh, uh, SSH deploy keys uh, and your personal access tokens access to the GitHub repo API. But I will just um, make this public instead. I have to just change the default there. Uh, I'm going to have a reconciliation path in a canonically good clusters directory and in particular directory for this cluster kind of so let's go ahead and bootstrap that and then um yeah that's this usually takes like a minute or two uh basically it's applying all of the flux install manifest to the cluster uh and then configuring my synchronization to the repo that's being created uh we should be able to already uh, see that that repo what is it Delphi box made one of these earlier, I think, with the same name. Soft flux playground. Should have a public repo. Yep. It's not private. And in the settings, there should be a deploy key configured. Cool, right? So brand new uh, repo that was just bootstrapped right now. And uh, it looks like Flux is already starting to synchronize. Yeah, bootstrap finished in about a minute. Uh, so this is a Kubernetes and Docker cluster that if you've never used Kind before, it's a great way to do a little bit of local development if you want to try out a Kubernetes environment. Cool. So um, let's go look around inside that repository. I'm going to just clone it down. Oops, that's the actual SOPS repository. There we are. So what I'm going to want to do here is a little bit of key generation and config. 
Um, for the purpose of this demo, I'm just going to modify these things directly. Uh, but you would probably want to do this in a patch. Uh, but just for clarity, just so everyone can see the objects, I'm going to modify this customization right here. And um, there is an option called decryption. Provider is going to be SOPS. And um, what is it? Secret ref. Yep. SOPS GPG. Cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a GPG key. Uh, and I'm going to put the private key of that pair inside the cluster inside of this secret key. And then I am going to put the public key inside of the Git repo. So let me show you how to kind of do that in a batch way with GPG. Um, sometimes you can have a, a little bit of issues with GPG. If you're in a VM, you can lack entropy. Um, also, there's a program called pin entry. It's important uh, when following the guide, there's, there's a statement that you can sometimes miss here, which is that when generating the GPG key, we want to specify no passphrase. And this is because we are going to be putting the private key into the cluster. And it is the responsibility of Flux to use that without any kind of interactive prompt. And uh, so there's really no reason to put a passphrase on that. Uh, as soon as we generate this key, we're going to store it in secure locations where no one has actual interactive access to it. Uh, you would probably also put this key into some backup location, uh, like a secure one password vault or something like that. Um, but uh, yeah, so here we have an interactive flow, uh, but I prefer to just use GPG's batch um, scripts here. Could probably update the. Um, example, honestly. So the way that I'm getting no password here is to specify this directive in this GPG batch script called no protection. Uh, this key in particular is not going to expire, but if you wanted to rotate them, you definitely could. Um, just using a mock name and email here, uh, might as well make that match the cluster name that I was intending to use. I was doing some key generation tests earlier. And um, yeah, GPG batch full generated a key. This is key type one, that's the RSA algorithm. And um, yeah, just a good key length and all of that. Uh, hopefully machines got enough entropy, we'll generate a key. I should show you as well. Um, here are the secret keys that I have on this machine. Oh, I already have one for kind zero. I should probably delete that. Oh no, that was just created. Never mind. Yeah. So 9140C2 is the ID of that key. Yeah, here's the secret keys. So that's the, the private ones. Then there's also the public keys. And um Just make this one 222. Yeah. Cool. Sorry, friends. I'm just getting a little confused because I had stuff in here from before. Let me just delete this one. We will delete the secret. We just want to delete the key for this identity. It's an old one. You get to see a little bit of uh, GPG CLI action here. It's actually going to show you all of these commands in general. But yeah, delete that old one. Cool. Okay, now it's less confusing. So if we look at the public keys on my machine, um, I, I trust GitHub. Here's my personal public key. And then um, just the ID of it. And then here's the ID of our public key that we just generated. So this is the, the key that we're going to keep around and put inside of our repository. And then the secret keys, you can see that I have one of these as well on my machine. Now it's important that this, this doesn't stay on my machine because I want to put this into the cluster and then have nobody else have access to it. Right. Um, so we're actually, we'll need to update the guide for this. Um, but 
that's that's an important note. It's not necessary to have this private key anywhere but inside a cluster and in some safe backup location if these secrets needed to have durable storage. So um, just an important note there. So what I'm going to do then is export that key. Right. I want to export that key. Uh, armor it just means to encode it in a text blob format. And then uh, I am going to put that into a secret inside of my newly created Kubernetes cluster inside a Flux system where Flux can access it. And um, here's just the key, the data key inside of that secret. It's going to be called SOPS ASC. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, GPG export secret key, right? Not the public key. I want to export the secret key and armor it. And that will be, sorry, got to get the list again. This ID is the same as the public key, just so you know. Export secret. Armor. That value, we'll pipe that to a kubectl secret, create secret, generic. Um, then what are the flags for this? Yeah, we'll put it in a namespace, flux system. There's one because we did a bootstrap inside the cluster, so that auto completed. This will be from a file, and that is. Sops.asc and dev stdm. Uh, oh, and I need to call it Sops GPG. So this name right here, Sops GPG, I will be configuring Sops or um, the customization inside the cluster that actually applies our entire path inside the repo is going to be configured to also be able to decrypt things using that particular private key. And you could do this on any particular customization in the cluster. If you had a separate decryption key for application teams, um, it certainly would be recommended to have different keys for different environments. So you have a production key, a stage key, and a development key. Uh, or if there are different teams who own things, you don't want their secrets to be able to decrypt other people's secrets, right? So um, you'd be generating keys for any particular domain or authority or team or organization that you are working with with your cluster. And the flexibility of this API doesn't force you into any one shape um, any organization type, any workflow, any separation of concerns, responsibilities, Flux being the best in class GitOps tooling can do that for you. Okay. So um, we will go ahead and make that secret. This is just part of the bootstrap flow, right? So I've, I've put that private key into the cluster. Let's go ahead and also export the public key. Um, oops, cancel. I, I have messed up. I'll just pretend that I didn't accidentally do that. <laughs> um, what in the world was I copying and pasting there? Okay, let's get the let's get the public key now. Go ahead and post a private key on YouTube. Luckily, this is an ephemeral cluster, so no one will be able to hack anything. <laughs> um, so this one is the public key, right? If you just use the export flag, not the export secret keys flag, then that one's safe to look at. And um, so let's go ahead and just put that into our repo. Right? Uh, we can uh, repos is our SOPS Flux Playground clusters. And um, I might as well put this into the Flux system directory. I'll just say that this is the stops uh, pub ASC decryption key or uh, encryption key. Great. So now my job as the infrastructure administrator uh, is pretty much done. Right. I have set up a brand new cluster. 
I've bootstrapped Flux into it. I have generated some credentials that are a use for encryption and decryption, probably back that up into a password manager. And so now I need to do a git commit to get the cluster configured and to uh, commit the key to the cluster or commit the public key for my teammates. So let's go ahead and just add those things. We'll look at the diff just to be a uh, good citizen. Uh, here we can see, okay, I'm configuring the sync for the bootstrap uh, of the flux system to have encrypt or decryption enabled using this secret. Uh, this secret is just implicitly inside the cluster because it was bootstrapped by the infrastructure maintainer. Uh, and then here we have a public key, which is safe to store inside of a repository. Uh, so let's go ahead and push this commit up to my public repo on GitHub. I will commit that we will configure um, soft secrets decryption for uh, case secrets. There we go. Oh, on verb. Commit, push. Uh, since I'm using a private cluster here, I don't have any webhook infrastructure, so I, I just need to uh, tell Flux to reconcile just for the interest of a quick demo. Great. Um, so that's BFB 118C and, or 18C. And then if I look at Git log, that was like the most recent commit that we just pushed up. So good. Um, even if you have read only access more or less to the cluster, uh, if you have the ability to annotate resources, I believe is the mechanism we use. Uh, you can annotate a Flux Git repository or customization to make it reconcile. Uh, so that's one way to give like developers the ability to reconcile a private cluster if you don't have any webhook infra uh, to push uh, events in. Or you can just tell them to wait for you know the one minute you know for that Git repo to pull again, which is super fast. So um cool our cluster should be configured now right if i uh, describe the customization now, notice i haven't done any kubectl apply except for that one secret creation uh, everything else that we're going to do to this cluster including creating secrets uh, can now just be managed purely through git and we know that that's secure the key only lives inside the cluster if we're decrypting secrets uh, nobody else should have access to that um, since I just said that, I just want to make sure that my job as a clean SRE uh, is finished, and I'm actually going to want to delete uh, both the, well, delete the secret key for sure, but we can also delete the public key as well. Uh, I copy the commit. Probably, uh, yeah. Keep that key ID somewhere. GPG delete secret and public keys. Just show you the flow here. Um, so yeah, I can just get rid of all this stuff. I committed that to the repository. So, you know, no one has access to anything. Now my uh, list of keys is just the one that I own. Okay. Um, might as well list the public key as well. List pub. So here we can see, I don't have that key anymore. Uh, let's describe the customization. And it looks like everything is good there. We'll just grep uh, for the SOPS configuration. We can see that that was updated by Flux. Check in the chat here just to make sure. Um, the YouTube channel is gonna be the Weaveworks channel. Mohamed, uh, great question. There's I'll actually a good playlist over there. Yeah, thanks, Stacy. Um, autocomplete in the, uh, who is that Kingdon asking? What what autocomplete provider is making VS Code work? Uh, I just have the Kubernetes uh, plugin from Microsoft. And I think it introspects your current cluster's CRDs. Um, so yeah, that's super helpful. Uh, that's that's how I was able to easily author this. Yep, good question there. Uh, the Kubernetes plugin is you can just look it up. It, you can browse around in your clusters and 
it uses the discovery API to do that autocomplete. A uh, really high quality thing. Pretty sure. Where the heck is the plugin window? Um, yeah, it's this one Kubernetes from Microsoft. Download that and you get autocomplete in your YAMLs. Cool. And what else were we doing? Yeah, we checked that it was configured. Cool. My job as the uh, infrastructure maintainer, the SRE, the DevOps person on the team uh, is done. Now I'm going to change personas, right? I'm a developer now and I want to put like a database password into the Git repository. Uh, commonly, you would be in some kind of workflow where you need to talk to somebody special to generate this, or you open up a ticket if you like work in a big enterprise, uh, or you just are super scared and you ask your CTO to look over what you're doing because you have no, no idea and you're trying to ship because you're on a five person startup team. There's so many, so many different scenarios in which secrets management creation, the life cycle of, would be difficult. But if we have SOPs and Flux, you can adopt a really good workflow here. Devs already know how to use Git. So if you can teach them one thing, which is just how to import the cluster's public key and then use the SOPs command line tool to generate a secret, um, then they can create new ones and add to existing ones without ever having to unfeel uh, or unwrap or decrypt values that they really should never be looking at or accessing. So, and um, yeah, let's see. So what shall we do? We're inside of our repo here. I'm the developer. I pulled this down and, you know, and I, I kind of, I checked the readme and the readme is like, hey, you should run these commands that I'm about to type, right? So let's go ahead and do a thought import or oops, sorry, GPG. We're gonna import a GPG key. It is gonna be the public key SOPS pub AFC from our repository for the cluster that we're interested in making a secret for. Cool, we're imported now. Now, you'll notice if I list the public keys, I have that, the one that we had before, it has that same exact ID DIFE9. Um, but if I list the private keys, or sorry, the secret keys, always get the terminology mixed up. I don't have the secret. Right, so I am able to send encrypted messages to a particular target, right, to a particular owner of a key. The owner of that key is kind zero, right? That's my cluster. And the only person who can, the only, the only entity that can decrypt my encrypted message is that cluster. And the way that I'm going to send that message is through the Git repository. Like this is where the magic starts to happen, right? Since I can give this public key out to every developer, we're able to use this integration. And this part right here, so the mechanism of actually putting things into the Git repo, that's SOP's responsibility. Now, the magic of synchronizing the repo to the cluster and then decrypting the value using SOPs, that's going to be our magic integration with Flux. That's this right here. That's this config, right? So that's already set up for me. I'm the dev. I get to produce a thing. Let's go ahead and author a secret. Uh, all right. So here um, in the kind zero directory, I can just add a new file. Um, we will call this the DB password YAML. Yeah. Now um, we have a DevOps person, and uh, she's like really all about Kubernetes, and she's been teaching us a bunch of stuff. And so now, like. I've done a whole bunch of these, so I can just totally bang out a secret, you know, just from memory. Uh, but oh, I guess we have autocomplete to help us. So I was I was trying to show off there, um, but and, and make a joke about how we can all become YAML developers. But I guess you don't need to anymore because our editors are smarter than us. So uh, yeah. <laughs> namespace this will be the default namespace i'll call this the db path and as well match the name of the file um we don't actually need that but whatever and then here's our gonna be our password value we don't really need to um 
Day 64 and code this because we can use string data instead. If you didn't know this about secrets, uh, you can use string data. It allows specifying non-binary secret data in string form. Right, so if you actually want to store stuff uh, without having a base 64 encode it, this is one way to do it. Provided as a write-only convenience method. So you can't actually read this thing back from the uh, API, but it's possible to store uh, values inside of your GitOps repository and apply them. Um, so here the password is going to be, you know, some totally randomly generated string. I like this, right? This is this is secure because it's really long. It has lots of words for the passphrase. This is actually probably one of the worst UX decisions in all of computer science. This if this was phrased, people would have longer longer passwords. And then uh, we have special characters, right? So you can't brute force it anymore. Anyway, just geeking out. Um, cool. So it's recommended when you sign up to remember your password. Uh, I don't, I don't know what Jeffrey's talking about. Sorry, Jeffrey. I don't get your joke, maybe, or what you're trying to, trying to bring up. Uh, let's see. So this is something that I wouldn't want to commit to the repo, right? This is a plain text password. Somebody has the repository. This is like totally database access waiting to happen, right? But if I use soft, um, so let's go ahead and just uh, list that public key. One more time, get that value. We'll go into the uh, cluster directory that has a new file. You can see I haven't committed this yet. It's untracked. What if we, as soon as we generate the secret, we choose to encrypt it? Oh my, what did I do? Okay. Apparently, I don't know how to copy and paste things still. Making a lot of um, terminal copy and paste mistakes today. Copy. There we go. <laughs> um, they doing encrypt. Uh, there we are. So I'm going to use SOPS to encrypt any of the data or string data fields inside of my secret. We're going to use a particular PGP, GPG key um, that we have. It's going to be the public key here. And I'll just do that in place on this file. Um, and this was called the DB password. So you'll notice that the file just changed when I used the soft so That's because I used the in place option. And now you can still actually read what the structure of this thing is. The whole file isn't encrypted. Soft is able to understand the structure of data files like YAML and TOML and, and um, JSON and et cetera, and only encrypt the key. Right, so I can see that there is a Kubernetes secret of the particular API version. It's going to go into the default namespace. I can version that in plain text in Git. I can see that there is a password. This is in plain text, so I can reference this data key in my application, uh, in my other Kubernetes manifests. I could reference this secret and do transformations on it using customize because it's a well-formed actual Kubernetes API object. But then there's this extra data here. Now that's an unknown field in Kubernetes, but Kubernetes will never see that because before this object gets applied to the cluster, we have configured SOPS, or sorry, we've configured Flux to use SOPS to decrypt it. And so then there's all of this information in here about which backend is being used. When was this secret created? When was it modified? as well as what key to actually use to maintain this secret and decrypt it. So that's how that this is this is how SOPS and Flux get glued together um, is this file points to which key should be used. And then the secret uh, containing the list of GPG keys that we have for available for decryption is then going to be able to uh, Flux is, is going to be able to unwrap this. Similarly, only using the public key, I could use a command called SOPS edit. And I can even, um, well, 
yeah, let's, we'll do that in a, we'll show a stops at it right after we see this hydrating all the way through the cluster. So we're not mixing too many compounds. Um, cool. So now I have something that's safe. It's wrapped up. Nobody can decrypt this. I can't even decrypt it. The, whatever I typed into here, I don't know how many hyphens or how many smiley faces I was using. Maybe some of you sharp people can remember zoom back in the video. Uh, but at this point in time, that value is lost. So let's go ahead and add our file. We can see here that what we're committing to get is only encrypted values and SOPS configuration for how to decrypt it. And if I simply do a git push, oh, sorry, git commit. Our encrypted secrets to our public repo. There we go. We push it up to our repository. Okay. We use our annotation permissions to ask Flux to reconcile the Git system. That commit was 31A4B. We can see that that has been pulled down, applied to the cluster. So if I actually use my read access to Kubernetes and look inside of the default namespace, we can see that our DB password was created just a few moments ago. And I actually have read access to secrets, uh, which means that I could use the, the crew plugin called view secrets. And um, what are we interested in looking at here? We'll just look in the uh, default namespace at db password. And there is our some totally randomly generated secret string. So remember how this was lost forever? Well, inside of the cluster, we actually have the decryption key and it's been applied with Flux so that the cluster is the only thing that actually owns that, um, owns the ability to unwrap this secret. So GitOps secrets management with Flux and SOPS, that's what's happening here. And let's remember why this is cool. Why is this important? Why is this secure? We're using asymmetric encryption, right? Uh, an SRE, a DevOps person, whoever's setting up your cluster, they can bootstrap Flux and they can generate a GPG key pair. Then they put that key pair into the cluster. They put the public, or sorry, the private key, the secret key, the thing that can decrypt values, into the cluster. They delete it from their machine or whatever generated it. Right? You could do it from CI. And then they go back it up somewhere, maybe. Then they put the public key, the thing that you can use to encrypt secret messages that could never be unwrapped ever again. You can, you can put that public key into the repo, which is what we've done here. Now, you can help, help your developers import this public key into their GPG um, key ring. And then they can use SOPS, right? SOPS encrypt. This is a little clumsy, right? Because you have this regex stuff in here that you have to configure all the time anytime you generate a secret. You could totally put this into like a make file um, and then create new YAML files that are configured you know, to be able to be decrypted. So here's our DB password YAML. We authored this just as any normal Kubernetes secret. In fact, we almost even didn't need to author it because of that VS Code autocomplete stuff. Uh, and then you end up after SOPS getting an encrypted value. You never commit the plain text secrets to Git and SOPS helps you get there as quickly as possible uh, by making sure that all of your data keys inside of your YAML are now um, properly encrypted. Now, uh, one more thing here is that the once the secrets are created, so say all of that soft encryption nonsense was a little bit crazy. Say you could ask your DevOps or your SRE or your platform team member for some help, and they could actually set up this DB password YAML for you. Now, say you wanted to add more fields to the connection string. Say you need to add like a port or a username, right? What can we do? What we can do, SOPS edit, and the, the user experience for this, once the GPG key is imported on your machine, is just super nice. 
because the key that's indicated for encryption is stored in the SOPS config inside that file. So I don't need to specify that anymore. Uh, that means that I can just do a SOPS edit of my DB password YAML. And config file not found in note keys provided. Oh, that was that was kind of unexpected. I, I have no idea why that didn't work. Um, I feel I feel a little bit silly. I thought I had tested this before. Anyway, <laughs> I guess you can't do a live demo without a, without making some mistakes, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, we had some questions. Why is from any email creation to remember your password? Yeah, Jeffrey, the magic actually is that um, when you're securing databases, it's a good thing to not know the password value. Um, so that's a difference uh, between like, say a user using a password manager, right? Or trying to remember their passwords in their head. Uh, versus trying to generate secrets that are going to be used in production. This is an important distinction. Um, if we're trying to generate secure passphrases to access databases and we want to be able to rotate in them and that kind of thing, um, storing those actual values encrypted in Git is a good way to manage the lifecycle in a way where we can generate completely random, incomprehensible passwords, encrypt them, and no one will ever know what the value is. So uh, really good point there. The, the, it's actually a feature to not remember the password. Um, subscription is handled by Flux before applying the resource. Quite different to the way that Sealed Secrets and their operator works. What's your take on that solution compared to SOPS? Good question, Sealed Secrets versus SOPS. I kind of prefer uh, the SOPS solution. Uh, there's kind of less moving parts. Um, it's a really nice integration. They've got uh, you know a ton of backends. I think that field secrets is a very valid approach as well. Uh, one area that gets a little bit clumsy with sealed secrets is if you are using customize and you're trying to like hash secret values, it gets really difficult to generate a, a actual kind secret object, right? a V1 secret, since sealed secrets is a completely different API group and type. And that can make your your customized configuration a little bit more challenging because then you have to configure the name transformer to be able to understand how to hash sealed secret names whereas with secrets it knows how to do it by default but these are all just little trade-offs in the different approaches um i think personally if i was just making a quick choice i'd probably use the soft integration uh, because there's less things for me to manage i don't have to install the secret sealed secrets operator as part of the bootstrap of the cluster um, but, you know, if you're using sealed circuits already, uh, then it's a very good approach. Um, also, SOPS is actively maintained. I think sealed secrets is kind of looking for some uh, maintenance community at the moment. Uh, doesn't SOPS edit require having the private key in your GPG since it normally does decrypt before an edit? Um, maybe. I don't know the answer to that. Maybe that's why it's not working. I, I don't imagine why you would need to decrypt the values in order to edit them. I'm not trying to um, to edit the secret value. Uh, I'm just trying to like add a key. But um, let's look at these. Yeah, it just kind of looks like SOPS is not functioning well. Let's see. Oh yeah, okay. So I think you're right there that that uh secret key uh, is not available to decrypt the file. At least one key has to be successful, but none were. Yeah, hmm. Huh. I kind of wasn't expecting that. I guess you would have to regenerate the secret uh, completely. So in that case, using a uh, make file would be important uh, because I definitely wouldn't want anybody to have access to the cluster's decryption key. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Michael. That's a that's a really good explanation. Yeah, so I think the it looks like the reason why SOP said it was not functioning is because I had deleted the private secret key that's used for decryption, uh, and SOPS is complaining 
um, that it's not able to. No, that's that's not what I'm trying. I, I feel like I'm just missing something here because I totally just did this last night and I didn't have this issue. Am I just like not? I feel like I'm just using the wrong verb or something here. Commands, publish. Is it edit? No. Edit encrypted file. Direct editing. What do we do? Sergey is suggesting perhaps you need to specify your secret key for encryption. Method will be used to. I, I, I you know, I, I wouldn't imagine that's true because the uh, key's ID is right here inside of the PGP provider for the particular file. Uh, this is a good suggestion. I think I'm just using the wrong um, verb, right? Uh, we only have a couple minutes left, so. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we'll happy for more questions to roll in, you know? <laughs> sure, yeah, if anyone has any other questions, we have about two minutes, so we'll be wrapping up soon. Um, um, Rosenloff? Sorry if I didn't say your name properly. I see that there's some special characters in there. Um, does SOPS work with config maps? And the answer is yes. You can use um, SOPS with any YAML file. Uh, and any of those YAML files being valid Kubernetes objects, you would be able to use customized controller uh, to decrypt those. So if you wanted to encrypt the container image uh, or a volume name, um, I can't really imagine good motivations to do that, uh, but there's nothing stopping you from encrypting any key uh, inside of your GitOps control repository and thinking those things just in time decrypted to the cluster with Flux and SOPS working together. Um, so uh, it, it works with config maps, it works with any custom resource. You could encrypt, you know, a uh, a password that's used inside of a flagger canary definition, if you wanted. Yep. Um, and then um, Mer Marin, Merit, uh, do you have any recommendations for preventing pushing plain text secrets? This is an awesome question. And one way that you can do that is say with like a, a pre-commit hook on the server side, uh, that rejects any commits that contain, you know, you could try to like parse, um, like run a linter for anything that is a YAML file that says kind secret, and then check to see if, you know, there are any keys inside of the file uh, that don't that don't start with ENC bracket, right? So there's there are ways to structurally um, check to see if you have keys inside of data or string data, you know. Uh, also looking for high entropy strings in general, um, if they don't match this kind of format, then you would probably, you could reject it. Uh, that's, a, that's a really good uh, question. As far as just like a tool that you could use out of the box to do that, I don't have one. Um, I, we should probably have a document, you know, inside of the, uh, that would, that would be a good document for Flux, uh, since linting for your uh, Git repository to not have plain text secrets would be smart. Um, so we are over by a minute. Um, so I just wanted to wrap up here just by saying thanks for joining us today. I'm sure people are dropping off because it's the top of the hour, but. Um, we're going to be doing these every two weeks, so come back and join us. Uh, next, Lee's going to walk us through uh, migrating from Flux 1, so be sure to come back and check that out. Uh, we're going to have some more Helm stuff on the 22nd, 
and then walking through some more of the flux guides uh, uh, in April as well. So come back and see us in a couple of weeks. And uh, as usual, please check out the flux discussions on GitHub and the uh, community is, um, is up there as well. And uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we look forward to seeing you guys again soon. And thanks for joining us today. Thanks Lee for, uh, for this great walkthrough again. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Yeah. Bye-bye.